Hey everybody, welcome to Amy Nolte Music. I absolutely love to improvise. It's the reason that I started playing jazz. It's the reason I've chosen it for my career. And I really like to think about how to show other people or teach other people to improvise also. It's not an easy thing to teach, but I feel like like over the last few years, I've had some little milestones where I, I have moments of, of light that click and I think, yes, this is a key component and I've got to, uh, I've got to share it with people. It's why I made my Nebula class about how to create strong motifs for jazz improvisation. I think that's one of the, mo one of the most important components that you can have when you're improvising is to be able to think of a motif of your own and, and play it and then have the courage to stick with it and see it through until it's kind of finished. I kind of feel like I stumbled upon something new this week as I talked to a friend of mine who needed some help soloing over the bridge of rhythm changes. Now the bridge of rhythm changes is four chords, D7, G7, C7, F7. One leads right to the other. It's all five of five of five of five. <laughs> Dominant seventh chord is like a major chord and then you just put the flat seven on top. Or if you go to the octave, you just come down a whole step and you've got a dominant seventh chord. It's very unsteady. It leads, it leads, it pulls. And what I, what I thought of was that in order, to, in order to make your way through something like this, it's really important to just have some jazz vocabulary. Like not what I normally harp on, like making tiny melodies and being able to see them through, but um, I'm gonna harp on something else. And, and this is just knowing basic phrases of jazz vocabulary that everybody uses all the time, kind of. It's kind of like being able to speak in a new language. Like if you were learning English and somebody said it's raining cats and dogs, like that's just like a, you know, an idiom that we use to express ourselves or, or it, so when you're learning a language, being able to, you know, you tell somebody they need, they need to learn things one step at a time, you might say you're going to put one foot in front of the other, you know, little pieces of language like that, little pieces of vocabulary. I think that's what is missing from a lot of people's tool belts as they step into this world of improvisation. And so what I stumbled upon is let's just listen to somebody else improvise over rhythm changes on the bridge and wait until something that they play strikes us as like, like meaningful. We're going to transcribe it. We're going to see if we can take it and put it into all of the other keys of the bridge. And that's easy. I'm not gonna spend very much time showing you how to do that. It's formulaic, it's math. Uh, but it, we're gonna go over to the piano. At, I'm gonna show you how to do that, which I think is gonna hit, make some light bulbs go on in your own head. And then I'm gonna take it deeper, which is going to be fun. All right, the chords to rhythm changes. D7. C7, F7. Like I said, they all lead to each other. D is the five of G, is the five of C, is the five of F, is the five of V flat, which is where we go in the next section. But with all of these dominant seventh chords, it would be really nice if we could just listen to some master, play us some lick, take that lick and see if we can put it through every one of these chord changes. Let's listen to the master of masters, Miles Davis, Prince of Darkness on Olio, playing with his quintet, John Coltrane, Red Garland, Paul Chambers, Philly Joe Jones. Here we go. All right, we've got Miles Davis doing this. That's what he did. He took the root of the first chord and he led us to the root of the second chord. So all I'm gonna tell you to do, I said it was formulaic, it's formulaic. We take the root, we go one, one, two, one, seven, six, five, four, four, four. That's all we do. So now we're gonna wait. Now we're gonna do the exact same thing over C7. We're gonna go one, one, two, one, seven, six, five, four, four, four. So now we gotta see if we can do it in time. <laughs> There's our first one. 
Cool, right? L let's listen to another. The next one we're gonna hear is John Coltrane. Did you hear that one? He played it over the G7 chord, so it sounds like this. So even though he didn't do it until, you know, after the first bar, it doesn't mean that we can't use it over every bar. So we're going to start on the fifth of that, right? We go five sharp, four, five, six, seven, one, two, four, three, two, one, seven, three. No, seven, six. That's what it is. It becomes the three of C, but that's our lick. So now we just have to figure it out in the other keys. So it's the five of G, right? We have to think, all right, what if we, what if he had done it over D7? Right, that's where it would be. Then we do it over G7. Then we do it over C7, find the five. Find the five of F. And don't you see what a nice lick this is? Like, say that we do it in D7, we find the five. We hit, there's a, there's a chord tone, right? That's one of the things I talk about in my Nebula class is the importance of starting on a chord, on a chord tone and also ending on a chord tone. Seven, nine, three, and it leads us right to the third of the next chord. It's, it's brilliant. Thank you, John Coltrane. Let's listen to another train lick. I think that's what it is. It's over the D chord. So it's like the one da ba do ba do do da do da. Getting the rhythm, getting the phrasing is is key too. So listen to it a few times to make sure that you you've got it. But here we start on the seven, a nice chord tone of the D seven chord. We come we come up with seven nine eleven thirteen. But on the thirteen, we play this kind of enclosure up to the root, we hit the seven, we come down to the five, which is our strong chord tone to start on. Okay, seven ending on the five, now we're going to do it in G, so we're going to think where is the seven of G, and it's right there. And, and it's easy because it's, like it's like a major seventh chord on the way up. And it's important to get your thumb on that top one. Now we're going to do the same thing in C, we're going to start down here, build a major seven chord pretty much. Same thing in F, start on that seven. These are great. And and like I said, these are kind of, I mean, they're kind of idioms of jazz. They're, they're vocabulary. They're not, I, I wouldn't say any of these licks, except maybe Miles's, that first one, um, that one that was like. I wouldn't say that any of them are licks that I've ever really heard anybody else use. Um, they're kind of unique, which is cool. But if, we can take these licks and think to ourselves, could we use them other places besides just over dominant seventh chords that lead to each other? And, and the answer is yes. Let's, let's see about that Miles Davis one. All we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what, what note did he start on? And it's like... So, I mean, that's a 2-5, really. Could it work over D minor? Yeah, it could. So, so what if we were playing like take the A train and we remember that when we get to the D minor, just at the end of the first A section, we can play three of those and come down. Let's see if it works. Right here. It works great. change it a little bit the second time but yeah we could use it we could use it over a two five one how about that last trained one that we did the one that went i didn't get my thumb under there we have to ask ourselves what are those notes they're all white notes so could we maybe use this not over a d7 but over a d minor like could we be playing so what and have it work?
let's try it. We could use it over so what? What if we even took it and changed the chord tones that it that it uses? So it, it was on the seven, right? We went up. Those are all fine notes over a minor chord, right? It's the seven and the nine and the eleven and, and the six, which is fine. Um, what if we instead started on the F? That would work great over, over D minor as well. Would it work over the D7 of the... Uh, over the rhythm changes, if we change it to, to this? Not really, but if, if I voiced it with a sharp nine in my left hand, that would work fine. It's a pretty cool one. I mean, it hits that sharp nine and it hits the flat nine. I don't know, you could do it. Like, let's take that other one of John Coltrane's and see what we can do with it. It was that one. It started on the fifth of the G7. Hmm, it's like another one that kind of resolves. So it was over G7 going to C. Uh, I think that if it was a 2 5 one, it would also work, right? That would totally work. Um, what if we tried it on the third instead? It would still work. It was on the third of D minor, now it's on the fifth of C major. That works fine. What if we tried it on the fifth? That still works, doesn't it? And now we're on the seventh degree of C major. So anytime we're wrapping up any song, we could use that. Like. Do you see what I'm getting at here? All we have to do is isolate a few licks. Like if you did one lick a day and, and you tried to work it over these changes of rhythm changes just over just over the bridge and, and you could there's nothing that says you have to stop at F7. You could go to B flat seven to E flat seven, right? L let me just make one up. Um, that's not a bad one. It just hops the octave on the root and then it does the bebop scale. That almost a bebop scale. I, I I skip the e at the end, but that's a nice one. And there's nothing that says that I can't mm, like embellish it. Why not? Just take it through all the keys. That's a fine one. If you don't have the time to transcribe a whole solo, why not just take a little piece from some chord change? You know, you know what the chord changes are. Take a tiny piece of something that grabs you, something that that you think you could transcribe, that you could figure it out, and and just put it wherever you think you can put it. Think about if you change one of the chord tones, if you could make it fit a minor chord, or if you could make it fit a major chord, if you could make it fit a two five one, if you could if you could make it fit like what about like all of me, right? What if we put the Miles Davis lick into the key of C and, and maybe just think about all of me for a second? Do boo do do be do like that. So if if we've got uh what if we just do that much of it? Then we just think, we're on the fifth of C major, could we do it on the next chord, which is E7? If we did, we'd have to just change it up a little bit in order to fit, and a lot of times you can just use your ears. Like, let's start on another chord tone. Um, let's start on the seven, maybe? That worked great. Okay, so. A7, let's try it starting on the third. All you have to do is adjust it so that you land on a chord tone. Does that make sense? Now let's do D minor. Um, that one's not great starting on the third, but, but you see how I skipped the B and I went down to a chord tone? Let's try it on an A. Might have sounded better if I hit the flat six.
hard to get you just launched into your next, ow, launched into your next section. You understand? I hope you do. I think it's super fun. Yeah. Like I said, I, I made this nebula class all about how to actually think of your own motifs. There's 13 chapters in it, giving you ideas and examples so that all I have to do is just give you like two notes. And then I swear you will think of the rest of the idea. Actually you sitting there in your own home in front of your own instrument, whatever it is, would actually be able to create things by watching this class. So you can get that if you sign up for Nebula. Nebula is available to you for a 45% discount if you use my code that you see in the description or on the screen right here. $30 for the entire year gets you that class that I've been talking about. It's 13 chapter class. It also gets you my two part class. Everything I know about chords part one, everything I know about chords part two. It gets you a lot more than that as well. Nebula is a great platform. It's an educational content only platform, much like Netflix, Hulu, you know, you can get the app for your Roku TV or your Fire Stick TV or your Android TV, or you can just access it through your computer or on your phone. You can see extended cuts of videos that I've put on YouTube that were too long for YouTube. So I put them on Nebula. You can see bonus videos that you won't see on YouTube, just on Nebula. You can see amazing videos by other music creators like Adam Neely, Mary Spender, 12 tone music. And you can also learn from Minute Physics or Thomas Frank teaching you about how to organize your life. You can watch the legendary series, one of my favorite things on Nebula called Jet Lag by Wendover Productions as YouTube people like me just race their way across Europe and play a very fun game with a lot of silly twists. Like I said, just $30 for the entire year. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you next time on Amy Nolte Music.